Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning, bright and early. Uh, it's nice to see so many people aren't afraid to, to wake up and talk about geopolitics in the morning. Um, it's really a pleasure to see you today and a pleasure to, uh, to have this event, which I think is going to be uh, quite thought-provoking and interesting um, for us at DIES. Um, so we're really, you know, it's a pleasure to, to welcome uh, Dr. Rohan Mukherjee from the London School of uh, Political Science and Economics, uh, who will be joining us today to speak about uh, his exciting new book, Ascending Order, Rising Powers and Politics of Status in International Institutions, which was published by uh, Cambridge uh, University Press. So the book examines why sometimes uh, rising powers challenge the international order, but at other times support the international order. And in doing so, I think it, it nuances this simple notion that rising powers are destined to enter conflict with established powers. And through, through its analysis of, of uh, a, a rich uh, history of, of rising powers, the US in the mid-19th century, Japan in the, in, in the interwar se years, uh, India's stance towards non uh, so towards nuclear non-proliferation during the Cold War, the book really demonstrates that conflict need not be the outcome when relative economic power and military power changes international, in international affairs. And it's rather how established powers and international stu institutions open up for status ambitions of those rising powers that dictates the outcome of conflict or cooperation. Now, the significance of China and India as rising or returning global powers is most evident in Europe these days because of the uh, response of Beijing and New Delhi to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And this is another complex subject that we've asked Dr. Dr. Mukherjee to tackle this morning. And it was a little over a year ago that, that Russia launched its invasion. And in response, the US and the, Uni and the European Union, along other allies, including the, some in East Asia, uh, imposed what were regarded at the time as unprecedented sanctions and restrictions on the Russian economy to punish it and to, in hopes of forcing it to end its invasion, to end its conflict. And led by the US, the West continues to provide military and financial support to Ukraine in order to fend off Russia's ongoing, ongoing aggression. Now China and India have done something quite different. They rejected sanctions against Russia and continue to avoid sharp criticism, in public at least, of Russia's military actions against its smaller neighbor. While Western sanctions on Russia, we've learned, uh, have been fa far from perfectly effective, uh, far from comprehensive, and there's still, of course, economic activity between the West and, the, and Russia, Beijing and New Delhi have went the other direction and have been increasing their engagement, particularly when it comes to energy trade with the Russians. Uh, President Xi from China visited Russia just last month on a state visit, reminding us of China's close relations and strategic support to Russia. And more recently, just a, a couple weeks ago, or last week, I believe it was, India sent a 50-member business delegation to Moscow and has stepped out as Russia's largest buyer uh, of, of oil on the international market and is looking again to renegotiate a free trade deal with the Indian, with between, the, between the Russians and the Indians. So the respective second and fifth largest economies in the world and the economies of the world driving 50% of today's growth, China and India, are responding quite differently to the Ukraine crisis from the West. And critics uh, would argue that they're providing Russia the support it needs to continue its war effort against Ukraine. But voices in Asia and the Global South would respond that Russia's doing something um, that the West should, should be familiar with. Um, critics in, in Asia and the Global South see Russia violating Ukraine's sovereignty and producing instability but they also point to the history of Western powers doing the same through colonialism or much more recently, uh, America's unlawful invasion of Iraq in 2003. 
So this morning we've asked uh, the question in this seminar, what do these conflicting views between Asia's global powers and the West tell us about the future of international order? And in, in part of these efforts at DEES to, to understand Asia better, um, we've also been working on uh, this idea of the Indo-Pacific and how the Indo-Pacific matters to our futures here in, in Europe. And you'll see this postcard on your chair. Uh, if you follow the Q QR code, you'll get to a series of articles that were written by outside experts for us uh, last year, including uh, Dr. Mukherjee, on how countries in the Indo-Pacific region are responding to the Ukra Ukraine crisis. So we've placed a bunch of complicated, thorny issues in front of uh, our, our speaker today. So I'll, I'll conclude now and, and let him get at it. Uh, but first to introduce uh, Dr. Mukherjee. He's an assistant professor uh, in the Department of International Relations at LSE. Before that, he was a, at uh, Yale National University of Singapore College in Singapore. And he uh, was based in the United States as well, um, where he received his PhD from Princeton University. He's not only the author of, of this exciting new book, Ascending Order, uh, which has received rave reviews for its originality and its scope, but he's also the author of, of, of journal articles in, in leading journals, uh, in leading academic journals. He's also a co-editor of a wonderful um, collection of, of essays on Japan-India relations called Poised for Partnership, which I highly rec recommend. So Rohan is, is very much the expert I think we're looking for uh, to learn about the global order, uh, Asia's role and coming role in that order, and relations to the West. So it's a pleasure to, to welcome Rohan back to Dies and Copenhagen. The floor is all yours. Thanks. Can I just step up there? Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, thank you, Luke, for that lovely introduction. Uh, <coughs> I thank you to Dees as well for, for having me. Um, I was last here in 2013 uh, on Luke's invitation. I was then a PhD student, uh, uh, and no one knew who I was, and Luke found me online and invited me to give a talk. And I was so touched and just like very happy that someone actually recognized my my work. So thank you again for having me back. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, and it's also, you know, uh, Luke and Dees have been, you know, following India and China for a long time before other people have started doing it now. And so I think that's really commendable as well. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is uh, talk about, well, China, India, and their response to the Ukraine war. What I'm going to do is do it in three parts. Um, so first, I want to provide the overall sort of the context of the overall response uh, of, uh, of countries around the world to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, especially in the context of the Global South. I think that's a term that already came up. And I think it's an important term uh, that we need to think about or an important group of countries. And China and India are very much part of that. Uh, I want to talk after that about the particular approaches of China and India to the war and to international order. And this is where I'll talk about my book, which Luke very kindly mentioned. Uh, and, uh, and the book looks historically at rising powers and how they deal with international order. And I want to conclude with implications for the current international order and broader insights that might be relevant to diplomacy um, and international relations. So that's the overall uh, layout. So the economic fallout of the war, as many of you will be aware by now, has been on the top of everyone's minds and so has the response of different countries. Uh, I think this is, should be a fairly familiar graph to folks who read the New York Times. It came out in October 2022. Uh, and, you know, we all know that the West, and particularly the, the US, the EU, and the UK, but also Japan, South Korea, even Singapore, uh, have placed sanctions on Russia and, and sort of tried to curb trade and other economic relations with Russia. Um, and yet many countries have continued uh, to trade with Russia after the invasion, right? So this, this graphic uh, looks at the average monthly goods traded, the value of average monthly goods traded uh, with Russia uh, in March to October 2022, compared to the average, the same average, in the 2017 to 2021 period, right? So it's comparing the before after uh, of the invasion. And so on the left, we see a massive in increase um, uh, in the value of exports from Russia uh, to countries such as China, Turkey, and India, but they're not the only ones. And on the right, we see the import picture, which is after the invasion, at least China and Turkey have increased their supply of goods to Russia uh, quite substantially, right? Um, from already a pretty large base in the case of China. 
Um, and so these images kind of show how difficult it is to decouple economies overnight, right? Um, especially in the case of, of Russian natural resource exports, which is really a large chunk of what's happening on this side. Even, even economies that are sanctioning Russia, like Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Japan, uh, in this picture, uh, have found it difficult to turn off the tap overnight. Uh, Japan still retains some investments in the Sakhalin oil fields, for example, in Russia, although there's talk of sort of pulling out of that as well. And in other cases, such as China and India, there's been a more opportunistic ramping up um, of energy imports from Russia, which was forced to sell oil at below market prices, uh, discounted rates due to the sanctions. And this led you know, China, India, and other countries to buy Russian oil at even bigger uh, or even higher volumes than before the invasion. Um, the net result was that the value of Russian trade actually increased after the invasion. And a lot of this, of course, is due to the higher prices of oil, because we're talking about value, not volume necessarily. But, uh, you know, that to some extent still offsets Russia's, um, you know, the, the, the disadvantages that Russia might have faced through sanctions. Uh, it still means that Russia has more resources at its disposal, largely because of countries that continue to trade. Uh, in the realm of diplomacy, uh, the difference between the West and other countries is pretty evident as well. Um, so this table has the six resolutions uh, that have come up so far or were passed in the UN General Assembly uh, since the invasion. The most recent one, uh, this last one being um, in February 2023, just before the one-year anniversary of, of the invasion. And in the extreme right-hand column, we see the percentage of countries that voted uh, in favor, so voted yes uh, on, these, on these six resolutions. Um, and you see that, you know, typically, or in most, in four of the six resolutions, these resolutions have enjoyed support of about two thirds, uh, or three quarters rather, of countries uh, around the world. Right? These, these are the, these are the resolutions that emphasize the violation of the UN Charter, and call on Russia to withdraw uh, from uh, from Ukraine, and also the resolution that invalidates the referendums uh, that were held in the Russian occupied territories. But the ones that get less than majority support, the third one and the fifth one, are the ones suspending Russia's membership at the UN, Human Rights Council, um, and also calling on Russia to pay war reparations to Ukraine. Right? So one can imagine that these resolutions had more bite to them than simply ones that call out Russia and say you did a bad thing. Um, and so Moscow probably put greater effort into blocking those resolutions by lobbying other countries, right? um, uh, or trying to block them rather. I mean, it's also the case, I think, that many countries that did not vote for these two resolutions were themselves autocratic countries that probably worried about setting a precedent whereby another autocracy was punished in material terms by the powerful group of democracies that is organizing economic and diplomatic efforts against Russia. So this also speaks to the sort of making the world safer autocracy debate that is going on with regard to China right now, which is different conceptions of international order based on your domestic political system, right? So is this an order that is largely meant for democracies, uh, where autocracies feel unsafe or in insecure and vice versa? Uh, what kind of order would China build and so on? I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. For now, it's just important to sort of understand the, the layout of the votes but also who voted for what, right? So this is a map that shows how countries voted in these six resolutions. The countries in orange uh, never voted yes in, in, in any one of those resolutions. So all six of them, uh, they did not vote yes, which means they either voted no or abstained or they did not vote at all, right? So these are the three other possibilities. The countries in green always voted in favor of the resolutions, right? So they always voted uh, to sanction or to, 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 uh, to condemn Russia and so on. And the countries in red always voted against the resolutions. That's not a surprise. There are only four countries in this category, Russia, Belarus, North Korea, and Syria. Um, and so the rest of the countries, the ones in gray, did some combination of, of voting in favor of some resolutions, abstaining on others, and playing it kind of in the middle in some sense, right? Now, you can think about the green countries basically as the West uh, and its allies, plus a few countries. I haven't really looked into why they exist, but it's surprising to see Myanmar and Papua New Guinea, but they're also countries that have consistently voted um, uh, yes uh, to, to condemn Russia, as it were. And we can think of the orange countries as firmly committed to not taking a position on this issue, right? I think they've, they've abstained or basically not voted yes on any of these resolutions. Um, so it's clear that all of these countries, the orange countries, are in what we would call the Global South, and most of them are in Africa and Asia. So from this follows the question of what explains the positions of these orange countries, right? Um, and this is a list of the top 10 importers of Russian defense equipment in the same period as the, the New York Times study uh, that I just restricted to that period. Uh, this is calculated from the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research's uh, uh, um, International Peace Research Institute's data set. Uh, looking at it from 2017 to 2021, uh, these are the top 10 importers of Russian defense equipment. Um, and the second column 
um, from the left basically shows each country's share of Russia's uh, total arms exports market. And the third column shows Russia's share of each country's import market. Right? And what you see, in a sense, is those who historically depended on Russia for arms uh, imports were much more likely to consistently not vote against Russia uh, at the UN. Right? The exceptions are Egypt and Iraq, uh, where I think the US has sufficient leverage to sway the outcome in a more balanced direction. Uh, even in the case of Egypt, however, I, I don't know if you all read the recent reports based on the leaked US documents that Egypt in February was considering selling rockets, artillery, and gunpowder to Russia and was you know, stopped in some sense by, by the United States. They planned to sell it secretly so, that, so as to avoid detection by the US, but um, the US obviously found out about that. So in some sense, there is a, something going on here with regard to, to defense and also economic opportunity around the war in the global south. But economics and defense are not the full story, I would argue. So this is, there's something about being a global south country that itself creates a tendency to have mixed feelings about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, something that Luke mentioned as well. And this is a map of the non-aligned movement during the Cold War. So the, the, the institution, the non-aligned movement, has expanded since then. But the, po the point I want to make is that sort of historical tendencies growing out of decolonization and, the third, and third world solidarity have to be accounted for to understand the global response to the war in Ukraine. Right? And this becomes quite clear when we look at the same members of the non-aligned movement today and how they voted in the resolutions against Russia. Only a handful of countries in this group, mostly in Latin America, have been firmly against Russia at the UN, the green countries uh, on the western seaboard of, of South America. The rest of the countries have either resolutely not voted in favor of any resolutions or done some mix of voting in favor and abstaining. So these are the red and orange countries. right? Um, so if, if we think of the first map from the beginning, which I showed you as represent, the green represents the West and its allies, we see that the West has very few allies in the global South on this particular issue. Right? Now, one could argue that UN votes reflect all kinds of considerations that are strategic, or maybe they just reflect um, the preferences of the, the permanent representative on that particular day. Uh, smaller countries often blindly follow their regional uh, agendas and so on. All this is true for regular voting in the UN, but I think this, the sheer global importance of this issue um, and the efforts by the West and Russia to lobby governments to their own side quite strongly give, suggests that one can bet that countries were thinking quite carefully about their votes. Right? And e but even if they were voting along regional lines or on the preferences of their diplomats, I think the choice of vote still tells us something important about the disconnect between the West and the Global South, especially when we look across six resolutions. It's not just one vote. Right, we're looking at six different resolutions. And this disconnect is further confirmed by public opinion data. Right? So uh, this is a large survey conducted by YouGov and Cambridge University in October 2022. They asked a number of questions about the war and, and in a number of countries. I'm just showing you a snapshot of a few countries and a few questions. And the, the questions range from, you know, before the war, they, they would offer uh, respondents statements right, and ask them to say whether they're true or false. And they said, before the war, ethnic Russians in Ukraine were subject to genocide, true or false, right? And you see large, sort of substantial majorities in European and, and countries in the United States saying that's false, although the US weirdly is higher, but that's a result probably of some amount of disinformation by Russia. Uh, then there are questions about Ukrainian government uh, uh, being under the influence of Nazis. Again, pretty substantial majorities. Western governments using, uh, b uh, another statement was Western governments before the war were, used, were building mili military infrastructure in Ukraine to bully and threaten Russia. Again, most people would say it's false, right? Uh, and who is more to blame for the war across the board? Of course, there are small minorities that can be explained by various factors, but largely, uh, there are also, what I'm not showing here is people who said don't know, right? This is not an exhaustive, obviously. Um, a lot of people did say they didn't know. Now, when you compare this to the same questions being asked in the global south, right? You see the answers flip, right? And this is, this is a, a, a fascinating sort of illustration where you see those who think that ethnic Russians were subject to genocide is a much larger percentage across the global south countries, right? Those who thought that the Ukrainian government was under the influence of Nazis, again, those who say that's true, substantially larger percentage across Brazil, Egypt, India, Indonesia, Nigeria. There are other countries in this set which I'm not showing you, like Thailand, Kenya, and so on. Uh, Western governments were using Ukraine. I mean, remarkably, right? India, Indonesia, and Nigeria, majorities of people thought that the West was using Ukraine to bully Russia. And finally, who is more to blame for the war? Again, very ambiguous, divided opinion on this. Uh, 
in in the global south countries right uh, the west gets a, you know up to 28% of blame in india um among the among the respondents that were that were that were surveyed right so some of this is obviously i think the result of russian disinformation but i would argue that an audience has to also be receptive to certain types of arguments for that disinformation to work and i think one has to think about the prior role of ideas and ideology uh to understand this very sharp disconnect between the west and the non west or what we might call the global south and so that's why i think we also need to pay pay some emphasis so far a lot of the the analysis has been done on sort of economic and defense relationships which are important of course but we also have to think about the role of ideas and ideology so while the west may have won the cold war in material terms we can see now that the end of history was not a defining ideological moment right uh there's still a substantial portion of the world in the global south that is deeply skeptical of what is essentially a western international order many of them see russia as an insider of this order actually and therefore they see the ukraine conflict as primarily an intra western or european conflict in which they have they wish to have no involvement at all right and non alignment in this sense is both strategically useful but also is a philosophical framework for thinking about the world and of course global the global south remembers that the, as luke also mentioned that the west has rarely been interested in conflicts in asia and africa unless it was for self interested reasons and therefore they see no reason to be morally compelled to be interested in a conflict except for, uh, that is happening in europe except for in their own interest there's also the legacy of soviet relations uh, i think that for much of the cold war the soviets um, quite smartly invested a lot in uh, big ticket infrastructural items prestige projects that enhanced the position of elites in many of these global south countries relative uh, to their opponents as it were you know building dams bridges um large uh, uh power plants and so on whereas the us spent most of its time building uh, education democracy all the good stuff that the americans care about right and i think that's also important but what it means is that there's a sense th- there's a sense in many of these countries that the soviets they built a lot for these countries right there's a certain sense of gratitude or friendliness or sentiment that holds over you still see it even when you talk to people in india they say that the russians were there for us right when when in 1971 when the us uh china and pakistan essentially banded against india in the in the war over what became bangladesh um russia was in india's corner they vetoed un security council resolutions that were inimical to india um and they supported india in that conflict and that memory remains right so in a sense russia is a long time friend for many of these countries um Lastly I think there's this idea of the west versus the rest that the west has dominated the international order until now the rest have acquiesced but many of the rest are now in positions where they can in have regional or even global influence I'm thinking of countries like China India Indonesia Brazil Turkey and so on uh, and these countries and others no longer want to acquiesce in an order that is not of their making they want to they want a say in the making of order itself and and this is where I would like to Oh sorry did it did they get switched around maybe uh, Oh yeah no this is yeah that's right sorry this is a good place to talk about um China and India the two most powerful countries I would argue in the global south both have continued trading with Russia both have refused to vote against Russia at the UN um there's some evidence that you know there's defense cooperation happening chinese parts are increasingly ending up in russian weapons uh, at least you know small scale parts uh, things that the the west is banning uh Russia from importing from the west and and you know both countries participated in military drills in Russia uh, as recently as September 2022 right they 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 took part in the Vostok drills of uh, September 2022 so this raises the broader question i think that as countries that seek to play a greater role in the international order why do china and india not condemn or sanction russia's gross violation of that very same order right russia's actions have violated fundamental principles on which the order rests on which the un charter rests which are sovereignty territorial integrity self determination all the things that india and china profess to care about why do they not condemn or sanction russia for that right and that's the sort of broader question that i raise in my book right which is why do rising powers often undermine an order that is enabling their rise right i mean by definition th- uh, a rising power is doing better than everybody else right they are rising they are relatively growing in power while others are stagnant or declining so they are already benefiting from the existing uh arrangement of institutions and norms and principles uh so why change or why try to change something that is working so well 
right? At other times, though, we see rising powers doing the opposite, which is they accept an order that constrains their rise. And famously, this is the case of Japan in between the two world wars at the Washington Naval Conference, where Japan accepted an unequal ratio in its ability to construct warships relative to the US and Britain, uh, and was quite happy to do so and cooperate, even though that meant that Japan would be less powerful going forward. So why these, these two things to me are, are puzzling, especially if you look at it purely from a material standpoint. Um, these puzzles are hard to answer from that material standpoint, because if an order is producing substantive or substantial economic and security benefits, it should be supported. Um, if it is taking away those benefits, it should be opposed. But rising powers often do exactly the opposite in these situations. And so the argument of the book is that it rests on this premise that material goods are not the only thing that matter to countries. Countries also care about things like status uh, or having a position of eminence in the, sort of in, in the global hierarchy. And so the great powers uh, form an exclusive club that manages the international order. Uh, we can think of the Concert of Europe going back to 1815 or the Executive Council of the League of Nations between the two world wars uh, or the P5 in today's world since 1945. Essentially, international order is not, demo is not democratic. It is an oligarchy, right? It is a managed by a group of great powers that agree that they have certain privileges and they will police the rest of the world. That is the fundamental contract that we all live under. Right? Um, and so they manage the order through a set of institutions in today's world that can be recognized as the United Nations, the WTO, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and so on. There are many, many institutions and treaties and international law and all of that through which the great powers manage uh, the international order. But rising powers, as they grow, uh, develop more self-confidence and seek the recognition of their growing importance within the international order. They seek membership of the great power club as symbolic equals of the great powers. This means that even though they are less powerful, the order should give them the same privileges they feel as it does to the great powers, right? So they seek to join the club. Uh, but institutions are often designed for the opposite, which is to preserve the privileges of the few. And this can create problems for accommodating the aspirations of, of new powers that are emerging on the global stage. And so if an order's institutions are able to create that status equality for the rising power with the great powers, um, I find that we are likely to see more cooperative outcomes in international politics. If, on the other hand, there is inequality, the rising power is more likely to undermine the order, and they can do so in different ways. This can involve trying to delegitimate an order through rhetoric and diplomacy. It can involve setting up new institutions in which, which have different hierarchies that place you at the very top. Uh, you, know, you can think of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank as an example of that. Um, the BRI is also often argu argued as a sort of prestige project for Xi Jinping. Um, or outright, you know, breaking international rules and challenging the international order. And that's a process that often ends in violent conflict. And so if we want to ameliorate violent conflict, we should think about the conditions under which uh, we can actually create more cooperation in the international order. The book has a few case studies. Uh, Luke mentioned some of them. Uh, I'm just going to go through them very briefly. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it more in the Q&A. Uh, the book has three sort of historical international orders starting in 1815 ending in the, with the end of the Cold War. And I look at one central institution, a security institution in each of these orders, which is the Declaration of Paris in 1856, the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, um, and the, the NPT in 1970. Uh, and I look at one rising power in each of these orders, so the US in the 19th century, Japan between the two world wars, and India in the Cold War. And I find generally that rising power behavior is contingent on whether that power has status inequality or equality. Um, and so in each of these cases, I find more cooperative behavior from these countries when they get that status that they are seeking, right? And it's important here for a second to note the, uh, the role of the place of the US in this analysis, right? Because it's not the case that the US is somehow exceptional in its desires for, or rather even that uh, what we're seeing today with China and India is somehow a uniquely Asian or uniquely contemporary thing. This is a historical phenomenon that has always been there when we see rising powers. The US had the same attitude towards the international order of being resentful of European powers and seeking, their, seeking equality with them uh, as, as a young country in the early 19th century, as China and India do today. Right? I think that's an important thing to, to put out there. Um, so today's order, right? The, you see similar patterns where China and India have benefited immensely from this order. Uh, the, the WTO and the free trade that it has brought about have made them very rich. Uh, international financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF have provided them with favorable terms for development finance. The NPT has pre prevented the widespread use of uh, widespread uh, the, the spread of nuclear weapons across the, s the international system. It has kept it to a very small number. 
and the UN Security Council has overall done a reasonably good job with peacekeeping, barring a few glaring exceptions like Rwanda and Syria. So, this is, so they do benefit, right? But as they rise, they are seeking status or what they call representation. China complains consistently about not being given its due in the international order. India seeks what, it's called, what it calls reformed multilateralism. And the BRICS really is about having a greater say in global governance. Um, and so it's not so much that these countries have necessarily an no alternative normative vision of what order should look like, although there is some debate on this regarding China. Rather, they would like to be the ones co-running the order with the US and the European, US is sort of select European allies, right? They want to be seen as equal members of the Great Power Club, but the West does not include them as equals. To China and India, the order is run by an exclusive club of Western countries that does not treat them the way that they would expect, does not give them the eminence that they expect. Right? Um, and you can see that a little bit here in the institutional setup of the current order. Uh, this is from a paper by Courtney Fong and Xing Hon Lam, which came out last two years ago now. Um, and it looks at the, the nationality of the chief executives and senior management holding yeah. positions um, in the United Nations from 1971, the year China joined the UN, uh, till 2021. Right? And you see that it is by far dominated by the U.S. and countries that are close to the U.S. within the inner circle of the international order. So U.S., France, U.K., Japan, Canada, top five. China's number seven. India doesn't even make it onto the... India and Russia are not even on the, on the, in the top uh, decile, right? the top 10%. So when these countries look at this institutional setup, they don't see a place for recognition of their equality. Right? There are other places where they see this as well. China and India have variously protested uh, inequalities, for example, in uh, the IMF and the World Bank's voting rights. Uh, this is despite them, China and India, being the largest recipients of World Bank loans and grants uh, since 1945. So this is not about economic benefit, this is about status. They care, they care about having more voting rights in these organizations. In the realm of climate change, they agree on the need to curb climate change, but they disagree that on the principle by which uh, responsibility has to be allocated. Uh, they think that th there has to be a historical rep uh, responsibility among industrialized Western nations. In human rights, they resent the fact that non-democracies non or perhaps non-Western liberal democracies in the Indian case will never be in the inner circle of the order, right? That they, their version of human rights does not see recognition in a, in a, in a Eurocentric international order. Uh, the law of the sea, for example, is another example where um, the fact every time the U.S. insists that China adhere to the 2017 ruling of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, China turns around and says, we'll do it when you sign it, right? Um, and in April 2021, um, there was a freedom of navigation operation in the Indian uh, Ocean near India. And as it's, is its practice, the U.S. Navy released a statement uh, uh, online saying they had done a freedom of nav nav navigation operation in the Indian Ocean near India. And uh, Indian Twitter went wild, that how dare they come into our territory and do this, right? If, why don't, if they don't adhere to the UNCLOS, why should we tolerate a freedom of navigation operation um, by, by the Americans in our waters? Now, of course, this is Twitter. There's a lot of bias there. But, I mean, it's, 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 it's a signal that there's something, there's something here, that people think in a certain way about these issues, right? Uh, in the Indian case, there's also resentment about the lack of expansion of the UN Security Council, as well as uh, the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty creating a two-tier system of countries where those who had nuclear weapons before 1967 are the only countries that will ever count as official nuclear powers in the treaty, right? India, having developed nuclear weapons after that, can never be counted as an official nuclear power, which is why India has not yet signed the NPT, even though it has no material reason not to, now that it has a nuclear deal with the United States. Okay, in closing, like two or three more minutes, um, what are the current implications? So I think I would argue that China and India will not defend an order over which they feel little ownership because it does not grant them the eminence they think they deserve. They share with Russia, in fact, a sense of being outside the inner circle of the order. And this is why they frequently articulated this desire for a multipolar global order. Right? They've had Russia, India, China, RIC summits now a number of times uh, between these three countries where they have articulated this desire for more reform of multilateralism, a more multipolar order. Um, and uh, India even joined this RIC, last, the last meeting of the RIC, which was in 2020, at the height of tensions with China over the border in June 2020. India participated in a meeting of these three countries. Multipolarity for them is not just about power. Uh, it's about the equi equitable distribution of status and legitimate authority in institutions of the rule-based order. And so the Ukraine war offers China and India an opportunity 
both in material terms to trade and get more you know uh, defense equipment and so on but also in terms of status that you know not following the west at this critical time puts these two countries in a position of equality with the west and gives them importance among other global south countries that are looking to be non-aligned as well and china is trying now to be a peacemaker uh, it has offered it most recently xi jinping spoke to zelensky uh, to show that it can also provide order in some sense now this may not be genuine but it still begs the question of why even try right i think there is this pressure to show that china can can do something here can be an order provider just like the united states is the limiting factor in all of this is of course russia's collapse uh, china and india's preferred world order includes russia as a pole the multipolar order suffers if russia collapses entirely so there is this sort of limit on how much they will support russia and they would like i think behind closed doors russia to stop what it is doing but they will never publicly say that right they would like it to remain a solvent country in some sense uh the broader implications i mean if you ignore status claims you can undermine international institutions uh proper institutional design can produce more cooperation um and there's this idea of responsible rise that came out of the us discourse under george w bush that countries will only be allowed you know countries like china and india should be responsible actors before they can be included in the top tiers of global governance and of course this this creates a sort of structural issue where China and India turn around and say why should we do that we will not do that until we are given that equality right we will not act in the ways you want us to until you treat us as an equal whereas the US says first show that show us that you're responsible and then we will give you that equality so this is an impasse that is hard to break um and this is the final slide what can be done um it, there is a structural problem status is a scarce good the great power club is exclusive and its status would be diluted if it kept admitting more members therefore there are high standards for membership and the US and others who are in the club decide who gets to be in the club um and so far there is this kind of impasse between the between the three countries uh, between the rising powers and the great powers but i would argue there can be institutional reform of some nature uh i think it's too late to accommodate china i think that boat has sailed um but i think that if the US is strategic it's possible to accommodate other uh, aspiring rising powers like brazil and india um and sort of reform the U united nations security council uh in terms of both its membership but also thinking rethinking the veto power for new members uh have more democratic working methods in the un security council i can talk more about this um in the q and a uh thinking about doing more to change voting rights at the imf where it should really change with uh, the weight of economies but it has been slow it has been lagging in in that because the us exercises so much control uh changing the official designation of nuclear weapon states in the npt uh, again these are all difficult things to do under the sort of existing treaty frameworks but it would certainly address some of the the status concerns that um india and uh, india has at least or uh, and brazil as well thinking about asymmetrical efforts on climate change um again you know can the west do more uh, or show that it is doing more so far the the discussion on climate finance suggests that the commitment of 100 billion dollars a year is is far countries are falling much shorter of that than than they would than they should uh but the greatest obstacle i would argue at this point i think in the world that we live in is something i haven't talked about which is domestic politics right i think domestic politics in all of these countries is tending towards making it very difficult for any sort of accommodation to take place uh this is true of the us this is true of china it's even true of india at this point and i'm happy to talk more about how that plays into all of this um in the q and a session i'll stop here thank you Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks so much. much. Thanks so much Rohan. That was excellent. Uh very informative and and I liked how you tied in very nicely the current events into uh your book which I think shows the the versatility and in uh you know depth that your book goes into that current events just slide right into the framework. Um So we have uh around 15 20 minutes for questions. I have a couple, but uh I wanted to hear if anyone in the audience uh wanted to to start us out. Um ne- yeah, that we got a couple great uh Niels will come with the mic and and please uh just let us know your name and affiliation um and and ask your question in, into the mic cuz we have uh, a live stream going as well. Thanks so much. Uh Thanks. Dwight Robinson, University of Copenhagen. Um thank you for the talk. It was really good. Um in terms of the great current great power club that you were talking about isn't it a, just a, a one member club at the moment with mm-hmm. the united states and they we have technically three outside powers with russia uh china and india 
how does the U.S. deal in this situation, maintaining the current order? Uh, because it is likely to be ostracized if these three powers come together against it. Um, and what are the risks of mitigating? Well, how do you mitigate conflict between these rising powers and the current club has to say? Thank you. Do you want to take another one or is that? Oh, okay. sure. I'm happy sure. to. Okay. Uh, or should I do it one by one? What do you prefer? Why don't we take Dino, okay. Dino here and then you can. Hi, thanks for a great presentation. My name is Dino Krause. I'm a postdoc scholar here at DIES. Um, and I was curious to hear if you also looked into the relationship between grain imports from Russia and uh, voting behavior because you had the, the table with the dependency on weapons imports from Russia and then that those countries that imported more weapons were also more likely to vote uh, no or abstain. And then I was thinking, for example, in the case of Egypt, that was the case, but Egypt also suffered quite heavily from the um, shortage of grain imports resulting from the invasion. So if you looked into this more systematically, mm -hmm. or what would you expect uh, if you w were to look into it? Sure. Thank you. Should I? Yeah, maybe okay. you should take those. There's a lot to chew on, and we'll get to some more questions after. Yeah. Um, so on the question of the one member club i think that's that's probably right i mean at this uh, although it is changing if you just look at the power distribution right i mean the us is no longer capable necessarily of of projecting its power globally the way it was in the 1990s or in the aftermath of the second world war um so what, there is also Britain and France in this equation, at least when you think about the P5, and I think they have institutionalized positions of power within the, the broader global governance structure. And so the question then becomes the US and its select allies from the West. I would include Japan in this because Japan has always had a privileged position when it comes to, say, contributions to peacekeeping uh, budgets or the head of the ADB and so on and other. So there is a there is a group here, right, that, that the US annoyance as its sort of chosen few that co-manage the order. And there are, of course, there are circles and circles. There are others, you know, the Scandinavian countries provide important uh, order management services as well, right, in this entire setup. Um, so the question, of course, I think China and India are much more obsessed with with the U.S. Um, and, and, and that club. Um, what incentives does the U.S. have if they know that the, that, yeah, it's a great question. So I think the U.S. Is a, uh, strategy would be to divide the BRICS countries. That would be the rational thing to do. So you reward some, but not others. You create divisions between the BRICS countries. And I've seen a little bit of discussion around that uh, in the UK, actually, in, in terms of the UK's own forwards. The UK is now talking about global Britain and so on. It's unclear what resources they have to devote to that. But one of the things they're talking about is thinking about uh, how do we manage the BRICS countries and should we treat them as a group? They are not. They have their own problems. India and China have massive uh, problems between each other. So can you play on that and maybe create differences between Russia, India, and China to make sure that, so there, so accommodation does have to happen, and I sort of alluded to that at the end, right, that it's probably too late to accommodate China, and China's already in some of those elite, you know, like permanent membership of the UN Security Council. But you can bring about others uh, and, and win their cooperation against China if you were to actually give in to some of their, uh, or concede or find accommodation with their, their aspirations. So I think that would be my answer to that. Um, yeah, great question on green imports. So even the arms data doesn't really show necessarily a relationship, right? Because all I did was look at the top importers from Russia and see how they voted. The real test would be to see both importers and non-importers and how whether the votes were different in some sense, right? Um, uh, it was just a very illustrative kind of thing. But I think yeah, absolutely uh, thinking about it more systematically, looking at long-term economic dependencies as well as military dependencies and whether the, the United States was able to substitute for some of that with offers of weapons deals or grain imports or other things that these countries wanted, uh, certainly, I think, would play a role. Yeah. All right. Um, there was a gentleman here with a question to start us off, second round. My name is Adam Worm. Uh, in the slides, uh, uh, what to be done, you mentioned uh, some institutional ch changes, but will uh, will that be enough? Because I understood that uh, uh, those abstaining countries uh, are unsatisfied by the present uh, content of the international order. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, another one here. 
thank you for a great presentation. My name is Fanny Ersko Massen. I'm a PhD student here at DIES. Um, and I'm particularly looking at Saudi Arabia, so I would like also to hear you. How do you see, uh, especially the Gulf countries, as sort of a rising power? Do you see um, the Gulf's closing ties to Russia and China also as a, uh, as a sign of just economic pragmatism? Uh, China being a great uh, export market uh, uh, for for natural resources, or is it also like a political counterweight to the U.S. to 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 try to uh, put pressure on the U.S. to set a new agenda on, for example, uh, countering the the demands for political uh, or, or human rights issues? Right. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, um, on the content of international order, I think that's a very important question, right? Because we often talk about procedure um, and institutional design, but we don't necessarily think about, I mean, I think a lot of people have made the argument that the fundamentally democratic nature of those who manage the order is at odds with the autocratic nature of those who would seek to break in. Um, and I think this is a this is something that we're still trying to think about, at least in, in academia and other people. Uh, what kind of order would China build? Does it want to simply control what already works very well and just be the top build country in that order, right? be recognized as the main, one of the main actors at par with the United States, or would it build something fundamentally different if it were given the opportunity uh, based on its own values, whatever those might be, right? Um, this is a this is a almost an impossible question because we don't have the counterfactual, which is you know a world in which China is actually free to do that. Um, so we don't really know how they would behave. Uh, most most people that look at this look at ancient China and think about how the tributary system might be a template for. All, I, I think that's not very helpful. Um, so so I think th the best we can think about is yes, there may be sort of substantive content related differences, especially on human rights, for sure. Uh, but are there procedural things we can do to ameliorate those other differences? Can we learn to live in accommodation? Uh, because the alternative is much worse, I would argue. And so if the if the desire is to sort of prevent the order from breaking down, there has to be some form of procedural accommodation, at least, with, with other countries. Now, it's, it, it may be possible that the U.S. decides that that's not desirable, in which case we go down a certain path, and that's also fine. Um, well, it's not that fine, but, you know, from an intellectual standpoint, it's, it is what it is. Um, uh, on Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, I think that's, that's really interesting. So I don't, I will, at the outset, say I don't know anything about that region, right, um, except for what I read in the news. What I do know is I've looked at Southeast Asia and I've looked at South Asia, and, and I, you might see similar dynamics there, right? Which is uh, countries strain under hegemony, right? Like if there's only one power in, the syst in, that, in that region that has been dominating the politics of that region, uh, the regional countries dislike that intensely, and they, they look to create outside options. You're seeing this in South Asia. Uh, the South Asian, you know, Nepal, Maldives, Bhutan, um, uh, less so Bhutan, but Sri Lanka and all these other, Bangladesh, are all creating outside options with China relative to India. They have strained under Indian dominance for so long that they welcome an outside actor that gives them a little bit more leeway to make their own choices in some sense. I imagine there may be a similar dynamic in, in with regard to Saudi and, and also the Gulf. Um, Southeast Asia, similarly, I think a lot of countries, you mentioned human rights, I think Cambodia is a very important example of that, where the US's constant battering of Cambodia on human rights issues pushed them further away uh, towards China, aside from the economic logic of doing it. So in a sense, it's a, re a mutually reinforcing logic, the political economic work together. Uh, if China started taking an interest in human rights, which I can't imagine happening anytime soon, that would change, I think. Yeah. Hmm. Wonderful. Uh, I have, Matthew, I think, has a question, and then one here. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Matthew, um, Matthew Gray. I worked with the UN for many years and now I work in corporate diplomacy and most of the companies I engage with are actually Indian companies, most of the largest public listed ones and Saudi ones and uh, actually Chinese ones. So those, that's, my, that's where I travel now and that's my, uh, that's my focus. I find it um, almost you have a bit of audacity and I'm going to challenge you here and sure. this is with a big yeah. smile on my face. I find that it's quite audacious to equate China and India so much as you do. Mm -hmm. um, from a UN perspective, yep. it's, it's um, aside from, I mean, there's, there's many different metrics I can look at, but the only things that are similar would maybe be contributions to peacekeeping mm -hmm. and population size. And everything else, I can't find one metric. Um, the only time where I see India having a bit of global presence would be the amount of CEOs you have around the world. Mm 
Um, I think India is dramatically struggling to become a regional power, and that's where they're aspiring to be, whereas China is already a global power and already a key architect mm -hmm. of the new global structure. I would just like to know where do you, and this is where if I was Chinese I would say this, where do you have the nerve to equate, if I was Chinese, sure. um, yeah. which, which I'm, I'm not, um, so where do you have, yeah, where do you, where do you find the, uh, the comparables? To have them, and I, I assume you're of Indian origin, and this also relevant to the question. <laughs> I understand that, um, but most of the of the executive offices I speak to in, China, in India from the from companies, they also would would be looking up to China, and then they would consider it as a, as a variable, um, and they wouldn't even really look at it as a, as a competition in their respective industries. Uh, I I just I it's a, quite surprising. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to hear maybe three or four kind of baselines that you consider that India is on par with China. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question in the middle there. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Christian. I uh, study political science at KU. Um, so my question is uh, about how best to frame the conflict between the West and Russia, and maybe even broader than that, um, the conflict between the West and and maybe China as well, um, because in the wake of um, the invasion of Ukraine, there's been a, a debate, at least in Denmark, about whether it is um, stupid to follow the American framing of the uh, conflict as being a conflict between democracies and uh, autocracies, uh, because that that framing by definition excludes a lot of the countries from the global south which we would have a strategic interest in aligning with us um, so my question is how do you see that and and how do you think that we could frame it in another way that maybe is better at including the countries that we want to align with us thank you great thank you should i take this too yeah, yeah please thanks yeah so i think one can uh, um, they're not equals, right? They're not at par with each other. I think that they have similar views on the international order, just as one might say the U.S. and, and France have similar views or the U.K. have similar views. I mean, they are vastly different in power. The U.S. can do many more things than what the U.K. and France can do, but they both have similar ideas about how the world should be structured and where their place is in the world. So that's that's the dimension on which uh, I'm I'm sort of equating, which is, I don't think, necessarily the right way to think about it. Having said that, I mean... I would disagree with this notion that India only seeks to be a regional power. I mean, if you look at the way Indians have described their own presence on the world stage, right from Nehru you know, to Manmohan Singh to Modi, there has been this tremendous desire to play a global role. I mean, the, the India and the UN in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was a major power, like a major figure, right? Organizing the non-line movement, organizing the G77, organizing various other groupings, providing technical experts to you know, UNDP, you name it. Uh, I'm sure you've sort of come across some of those people. Um, and so in some sense, I think, and, and, and in particular, when you, when, you, when you look at 2015 onwards or 2014 onwards under Modi, there is an explicit articulation then of that desire where Modi himself has said India will no longer play a bridging role in world politics. It will be a leading power in world politics, right? So there is from their own mouth a, an articulation, and this has been repeated endless number of times, that India will now shoulder more global responsibilities. India will be a global leading power, right? So, so if that's the case, then one has to think about you know, as Luke said, fifth largest economy in the world by PPP measures, third largest economy, second largest military, uh, nuclear arsenal, survivable nuclear weapons, nuclear triad. If we don't take them at their word when they say they want to be a global power, that is a problem, right? Uh, that perhaps suggests blind spots from where we're sitting and looking at the, the, the issue. Um, from China's perspective, I think there is this, uh, what we might call a studied indifference towards India, right? That historically China has thought of India as this poor, backward, uh, kind of useless country in south of the border. Um, it's only more recently that we've seen an uptick in the way Chinese analysts and the public are talking about India as a concern after the Ladakh crisis, because I think the PLA thought that India would not do anything when they occupied, you know, a thousand square miles of territory out of nowhere in the middle of the pandemic. But in fact, India was able to devote considerable military resources and has always, you know, for the longest time been the only country with a standing army facing China in the world, right? So in that sense, I think there is a revaluation if you look at the sort of, I don't speak Mandarin, but I've read people who sort of summarize these, these, uh, the, the public discourse among the analysts at least. Um, and of course, that's all very top down in some sense, but you get a, you get a sense that there's a, a change in the way India is being thought about, if nothing else for the reason that uh, 
Picking a fight with India this time is a bad idea if you have a Taiwan contingency down the road, right? You don't want to tie yourself down with a relatively capable army on land borders when you have to do something uh, with Taiwan on, at the other end, right? So, so in that sense, I think, yeah, Chinese would definitely say, where do you get the nerve to compare India and China? Because China sees itself in a completely different league. But that still speaks to those status politics, right? China's comparator is the United States. India's comparator may be China and the United States, right? And I think that's true. Right. I think so. Uh, so maybe business, and there's also a difference between business, state, business, society perceptions here, right? Absolutely, I think Indian business does not. I mean, they look up to the Chinese way of doing business very often, uh, but they also look up to the Americans. I mean, the American dream is plays extremely well in India, right? Um, and so, in that sense, I think there's a state business thing. But when you look at the Indian state, the Indian foreign minister after 2020 has very clearly stated, actually, uh, since 2017, the Doklam crisis, where uh, the India actually essentially you know, invaded another country to, to stop China from building roads in, in, a, in a disputed area. India invaded Bhutan. Bhutan never said anything about it. Um, uh, from that point onwards, India has said that it is no longer business as usual with China, right? Our relationship cannot carry forward um, if the Chinese don't stop messing around on the border. So in that sense, to the extent that state has, the state has control over business, this is still going to override whatever business may think about China, right? And, and you see that in the policies that have been enacted. They've stopped FDI, uh, they've, they, or rather they're dragging their feet on Chinese FDI. Uh, they banned a bunch of apps, including TikTok, um, and you know, all of that has happened well before the West has started thinking about banning TikTok. So, so yeah. Um, on framing the conflict between uh, Western, this is so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's interesting, like, p the, the democracy versus autocracy point, I think it's extremely valid. And, when, when you read new U.S. national secure, uh, strategy documents, right, the Biden's NSS, for example, talks about uh, democracy, this is the fight for democracy and so on. I think a lot of that is signaling to domestic audiences as well as U.S. allies, right? I think Europe cares a lot about democracy and the, and the U.S. Is, is, wants to keep Europe on side in maintaining the international order. But the moment you leave that space and you go to Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, so on, most countries are not full democracies, right? If you look at the measures, the polity score, the economist freedom index, whatever, they're all hybrid democracies, one-party state systems, and so on. They are deeply skeptical of any agenda that rides on the back of democracy. So you're absolutely right. And I think this would be a failing of US strategy if they really push that as a main thing. If you think about the liberal international order, as it's called, right, as democracy, capitalism, and multilateralism, to simplify it really radically, uh, capitalism plays the best in the, in, in the global south, right? Multilateralism, to some extent, works. I think it, you know, ASEAN, for example, really values multilateralism. Um, other countries may, f as a source of influence. Democracy, not so much, right? And those who are, and, and, and as we know now, there's, there's been a global tide against democracy. More countries are becoming authoritarian. Even in the West, support for democracy is declining dramatically. People who are born in more recent decades don't value democracy. The data, the Yasha Monk and Roberto Foa article shows us that, right? That if you're born in the last few decades, you don't care that much about democracy. Um, so when there's a crisis of the liberal order from within, uh, as well as there's always been this non-democratic position without, it might be a really bad idea to keep harping on that one. I think it, it speaks a lot about American anxieties about its own democracy, rather than anything to do with global order. Great. Sorry, I no. went on very long. But those are great questions. <laughs> Perfect, and great answers, and a really illuminating talk, Rohan. Thanks for taking the time to join us in Copenhagen. Thank Please you. get your hands on the book, Ascending Order. Um, lots in there to learn as well. Uh, and, and thanks for, for showing up this morning, and, and thanks for joining us, and thanks for the great questions from the audience. I think it was a great discussion. Thank you.